Good evening, welcome to Junk Radio, a pipcast from Nukipedia, the Fallout Wiki. Our first program in a moment will be the Nukipedia Network News, bringing you the latest from the Xbox Showcase. At 7 minutes we have a creature feature with LS. At the 10 minute mark we'll take a meditative moment with a thought for the day, which will be followed at 12 minutes by Xera giving us this month's Tech Talk. At 13 and a half minutes we'll go behind the games with Layman's Rain, who will take us to London to discuss Pindar, and lastly at 17.40 we'll have a roundup of the Wiki News in Public Occurrences. Junk Radio is sponsored by the Lucky 38. We hear you knocking, but you can't come in. Welcome to Nukipedia Network News. I'm Agent C. The Bethesda Xbox Showcase screened this last weekend. No new game. However, we did see more of the upcoming expedition to the pit. The pit is coming this September and sees the local union battling raiders, trogs and other nasties. The expedition promises repeatable missions aimed at those above level 50, although you can join at a lower level if you dare. Expeditions leave from the White Springs Bronca. The trailer also suggests that we might see a musical update. The story trailer features Downtown, performed by English artist Petula Clark, which has not yet been heard in any Fallout game to date. The song was written by Tony Hatch, who wrote many of her songs, whilst Petula Clark herself is sometimes known as the First Lady of the British Invasion. The song saw its release in 1964 and reached top 10 places in both the US and the UK, and has seen many artists cover it. Although we didn't see a new Fallout at the showcase, we did see some new Bethesda and Obsidian games to be excited about. If you haven't watched the showcase, a quick PSA, although Bethesda is in the title suggesting Bethesda games might be the focus, about 90% of the content are games that have nothing to do with Bethesda. A more honest title for the showcase would have been games coming to Game Pass in the next 12 months, as this was the real focus of the show. From Obsidian we had two games featured. The first we'll talk about is Grounded. If you're familiar with the Disney movie Honey I Shrunk the Kids, then you're most of the way there. Teenagers have apparently been going missing, but in reality, they're in the backyard shrunk to the size of bugs. This promises to be a multiplayer first-person survival adventure and is currently in previews on Xbox Game Pass or Early Access on Steam. It already has 10 million players. The Early Access price is still available and will be $10 cheaper than on its release day, so get that bargain now. There's already a fandom wiki community open at grounded.fandom.com. The other game shown is Pertament, which we understand to be something of a passion project for Josh Sawyer since his Van Buren days. The game looks like an illuminated manuscript from the medieval ages, and the game has you playing as Andreas Mahler, a journeyman artist who is thrown into centre stage after a monk friend is accused of murder. Your choices in resolving the scenario then snowball into other events as the game covers the next 25 years of his life. Yet we're also told that this isn't a mystery game, but more of an interactive narrative adventure with lots of player choice promise. The visuals scream more indie project than a game coming from a Microsoft owned studio. You hear scratching as words are written instead of audio speech. Our own Tagazil has started the wiki for Pertiment already, and you'll find that at pertiment.fandom.com. That's pertiment.fandom.com. But now on to the stars of the show. The showcase was bookend by two Bethesda games. The first is Redfall. Redfall is the latest from Arcane Studios and builds on Dishonored. You and a small team will fight to free the idyllic resort town of Redfall off the coast of Massachusetts from vampires, choosing from a cryptozoologist, a telekinetic student, a combat engineer and a sharpshooter. The game promises lots of action and a story in a real world looking environment. It's due for release next year. There's also a wiki set up for Redfall at redfall.fandom.com, but it doesn't look like it has any contributors yet, so you could be the first. That's redfall.fandom.com. The big one, however, is Starfield. How big? Well, I'll let Todd answer that for you. Let's take a look at one of our planets, Jemison. You can land in New Atlantis, but you can also land and explore anywhere on the planet. And it's not just this planet. It's all the planets in the system. From barren but resource-heavy ice balls to Goldilocks planets with life. And not just this system, but over a hundred systems. Over 1,000 planets, all open for you to explore. Starfield is promising a return to Fallout 4 style gameplay as opposed to Fallout 76, with single player adventures, settlement building, crafting, mods, skills, and traits all returning. 
joining Starship Construction, Asteroid Mining and Space Combat. Bethesda also confirmed that your character will not be voiced, resolving a complaint many have had about Fallout 4. The graphics look like an evolution rather than a revolution from Fallout 4, so don't expect much in that department. You'll find Starfield like Redfall is due early next year. Let us know what you'll be playing in the comments. If you'd like to contribute to the Starfield Wiki, you'll find that at starfield.fandom.com. Again, starfield.fandom.com. Fallout Shelter is seven years old. To celebrate until the 19th of June, you can get free rewards and 50% off select bundles in the store. These apparently vary by platform and your location, so we can't tell you what they are. We also have some exciting updates for Fallout 76 this month. In Test Your Metal, you'll join forces with the Gladiators of Steel to battle bots sent by the Rust Eagles inside the Savage Divide's Metal Dome. Promise rewards include Botsmith Armor, and this should be hitting any day now. After that, we'll have the Moonshine Jamboree. Moonshiner Ned needs Acidic Gulper Venom to make Maya Magic Moonshine. You'll find him and a horde of gulpers down in the Maya. This event promises Raider Reputation and the Gulper Smacker Legendary Weapon. For those of you looking for Settler Reputation, however, you'll want to participate in the Eviction Notice public event. The Settlers are trying to expand into a blast crater and have attracted the attention of nearby super mutants, and you'll need to clear out the crater and protect its rad scrubber, or else we're promised worse will happen. Season 9 starts after the June 14 maintenance, and we're promised a new score titled Heart of Steel, A Dread Island Tale. This will have the usual goodies and rewards and currencies, camp objects, power armor, and weapon paints. You'll hear Dread Island on Pirate Radio, or if you don't want to wait, you can read the transcripts on the wiki now. Junk Radio is sponsored by Rose's Raider Radio. Why are you listening to this loser when you could be listening to Rose? Hello everyone, and welcome to the Fallout Creature Feature where we take a look at some of the most notable animals, monsters, and strange beings that inhabit the wasteland. I'm L.S., and since this is our first episode, I thought we'd start with some of the most iconic creatures in the franchise. Our topic today is the ghouls one of the most notable remnants of the Great War, and a major element of any Fallout game's population. Essentially, ghouls are people or animals who have been affected by radiation to the point that their lifespans are extended and they resemble zombies. Long periods of exposure to radiation leads to mutations and radiation damage. By the time an organism is completely transformed, radiation can even heal them. The most notable physical result of this mutation is the deterioration of the skin, exposing the muscles and blood vessels, even leading to the loss of the ears and noses. This process, known as ghoulification, can happen either through accidental exposure or, in the case of a few ghouls like Dean Domino, through design. In order to lengthen their lifespans for whatever future plans they have, some people pre-war would gradually expose themselves to radiation in order to become ghouls. This can lead to a very interesting contrast between people who accidentally became ghouls and people who used the ghoulification process in order to fulfill objectives that they've been patiently waiting to accomplish. Despite the physical changes to their bodies, many humans who have undergone the ghoulification process still have access to their mental faculties and have learned to adjust to life a few hundred years after the bombs fell. However, this isn't always the case. For some ghouls, the prolonged radiation exposure results in deterioration of the mind, leaving them feral, attacking anything and anyone who comes across their paths. The Fallout universe is harsh for everyone, ghouls especially. Although they're a major part of the Fallout population, ghouls are subject to a great deal of bigotry from certain non-ghoul humans, and hearing epithets such as zombies are a way of life for ghouls living in the wastes. Even though the ghouls we refer to are almost exclusively human, there are also ghoulified animals that can be encountered throughout the wasteland, such as gorillas, beavers, wolves, and squirrels. These ghoul animals serve as a reminder that the Great War affected Earth's entire population, not only humans. Ghouls are Fallout icons. They serve not only as major parts of the wasteland population, but as a living reminder of the madness of nuclear destruction. They're synonymous with Fallout for good reason. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fallout Creature Feature. For Junk Radio, I'm L.S.
Has anyone ever told you that you have a face for radio? We're looking for people to talk, to write, and be otherwise part of the junk radio movement. If you'd like to be a part of it, email us at nukafalloutwiki at gmail.com, or tweet us at Nukipedia, or just come visit us on the Nukipedia Discord. You'll find Nukipedia at fallout.fandom.com. That's fallout.fandom.com. Children, today's sermon is this. Learn to embrace pain as your closest friend, for pain is the most instructive force in the universe. Break yourself until you can exist no longer as an individual. Then remake yourself into the master's tool. That is the solution to all of your problems. The old world was filled with evil and decadence. The holy flame destroyed it. We can either fear the holy flame or worship it and attempt to understand it. The children have chosen understanding. Although we do not wish to see the holy flame unleashed again. The holy flame is a metaphor for the death of the old world and the beginning of the new. It is the power of life and death. What is more worthy of worship than that? Hey there, I'm Xera. Uh, I'm a technical editor on the Nukipedia Fallout Wiki. So lately there's been a lot of confusion as to what's going on with fandom. What's a media wiki? Media wiki is the software that all of fandom is using. So each individual wiki is its own instance of MediaWiki. All Fandom is doing is updating the software to one of the most recent versions to help fix bugs and security flaws and other things like that. It's very important to update the software every once in a while to fix security flaws, bugs, add new features that could be very useful to those of us who do edit the wiki. In general, the updates are minimally affect most people, but it, this is going to allow for fandom to be able to do more things theoretically this would allow fandom to do more due to additional features and other things that were added into the updates so this is just a routine thing it's a it's a very good thing for them to do they're not getting taken over there's no real change to the general running of things or how things work next month we let the cat out of the bag Tagazeal presents Lore and Order, coming this July to Junk Radio. If you watched the Fallout London gameplay trailer, you might have heard a reference to Pindar stations. But what's a Pindar? If you go searching online, you might be confused by articles about Greek poetry. Are you as confused as I was? I'm Lemons Rain, and join me as we go behind the games. If you've ever visited London, you may have walked along Whitehall. It's a road that connects Trafalgar Square to Parliament. As you walk down, you'll pass the Horse Guards as well as Downing Street, so it's usually packed with tourists. A block away, towards Buckingham Palace, you'll find Churchill's wartime bunker. It is underneath this street, it's said, lies Pindar, or to give it its official name, the Defense Crisis Management Center. At Fallout, we're not strangers to the idea of continuity of government sites. In Fallout 2, we met the Enclave on their offshore oral rig. Fallout 3 took us to Raven Rock, and Fallout 76 took us to the granddaddy of them all, the White Springs Congressional Bunker. You can think of Pindar as being very similar to these locations. Plans for Pindar were drawn up in 1979, and construction started in 1982, finished 10 years later. It was to be built inside the shell of an existing World War II bunker. 
Pindar cost 126 million pounds, and as you would expect, it can protect its inhabitants from nuclear or other attacks, and has catering and sleeping facilities. It's said to be at least two levels large, but only those who have been inside can say for sure just how big it is. If you think 1979 is a bit late to be building a continuity of government shelter, don't worry. It wasn't the first of its kind, and we'll cover those on another show. Unlike Fallout's vaults, or other real-world continuity of government bunkers, Pindar isn't just waiting for the big one. It's being used as a secure government communication site and to war game potential crises right now. It has a permanent staff and it has been suggested that the UK government's secret of emergency COBRA meeting room is in this facility. It's perhaps from here that the command to fire Britain's nuclear arsenal would be given. Unlike a vault tech vault, there are many ways to enter or exit Pindar, but no one is saying where these are. Rumors say it is connected to important government buildings like the Prime Minister's residence, but the government has denied that it's connected to any transport system. But there are underground and regular train stations nearby, though this may just be a technicality. Perhaps the weirdest thing about Pindar is, as much as it may be an official secret, its existence is a pretty poorly kept one. In 1994, the UK government answered questions to Parliament about the facility, the answers of which are contained in the official record known as Hansard, although to be fair, not all answers were exactly enlightening. In 2003, the BBC was allowed to film inside as it was used during its Iraq war documentary Fighting the War to record some teleconferencing. But even more significantly, David Moore has published a photo book called The Last Things, which describes the photos as being from inside an underground government facility in central London that cannot be named. This facility is widely understood to be Pindar. Moore's book shows an odd collection of photographs, many you would expect such as the secure doors, the broadcast studio, teleconferencing facilities, and some you would not, like the supplies of toothpaste and mouthwash. You can see many of these photos on the photographer's website. Although other underground and secure facilities do exist within London, Pindar is a single facility. There is no network of Pindar bunkers like there were with its predecessors. Or at least, if there are, nobody is talking about them. How will this compare to the Pindar we find in Fallout London? Well, I'm excited to find out. But we'll just have to wait until the mod launches. Do you have a piece of Fallout technology you think we should cover? Let us know in the comments or by tweeting at Nukapedia or by emailing nukafalloutwiki at gmail.com. This is Public Occurrences, where we look at happenings on the wiki. Here's our headlines. Despite avid support from Jaspol, JCB, aka Soul Survivor, has failed in their attempts to have their permaban lifted under the St. Payne rule. The vote, however, wasn't without controversy, with users linked to attempts to build a competing Fallout wiki returning to vote in his favour. However, no evidence of foul play has been shown to date. Following Kadaro's continued refusal or inability to hand over the passwords to Nukopedia's original YouTube account, the wiki has decided to adopt the YouTube account formally linked to the vault. This takes the wiki one step closer to completing the merger with the vault, with plans already in place to combine and reinvigorate other social media accounts. We'll be making this transition over the next few weeks, so please don't be alarmed if you see us linking things or old accounts you followed come back to life. We'll also be merging with their Facebook at some point in the near future. The wiki has passed a vote for a new policy on recreated assets. If you see something obscured in game that can't be pulled out in a way that demonstrates it, you can now recreate it and upload it to the wiki. This will help us demonstrate things that otherwise would be difficult to show, such as flags or company logos when they're covered with dirt, rust or otherwise ripped up. There's a lot of discussions happening on the wiki at the moment, including locking down our procedure on changing policies. This comes after a lot of unauthorised changes were detected in our policies. After a massive audit, those unauthorised changes have been reverted to the versions of the community previously last agreed to. Please make sure that you do join us in the forums for that, as it will help shape how we'd make decisions in the future. And building from this very soon, perhaps by the time you hear this, we'll have a vote up for a new canon policy. This is needed as the one that was published was essentially rewritten without community authorization from the ground up and in many places said the exact opposite of what the community had agreed. Please make sure you do participate in this when it hits as it will help ensure our articles contain the content that you want. Lastly, we do want to put a special shout out to an editing team that is dedicated to putting things right. 
Following revelations that many showpiece articles had been stripped down to barebone versions of themselves and non-game law had been removed from many articles, a team has stepped up to put it right. They call themselves Project Wanker, which I'm told is a reference to it, where in many of the edits, the content that was cut was cut with an edit summary suggesting that wank had been removed from articles. This group has seen some massive improvements in our articles, sometimes quadrupling the amount of information on our pages. So in exchange for your hard work, Savior DJ, Tagazil, Intrepid, Layman's Rain, thank you very much. I'm sure our grateful readers would thank you personally if they could. We hope you've enjoyed this broadcast of Junk Radio and will join us again next month. Remember, we are an open access pipcast that anyone can participate in. If you have an idea for a show, we want to hear from you at nukafalloutwiki at gmail.com or tweet at nukapedia. You'll also find us at fallout.fandom.com. That's fallout.fandom.com. We close today's broadcast with the President's own United States Marine Band playing the national anthem. Good night. <laughs> And a friendly reminder, please turn off your Pip-Boy.